Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, and things to come when we can figure it out. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And I am joined by my two regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan. Hi, everybody. And Steve Marinucci, who I like to call the world's last (laughs) remaining full-time Beatles reporter in periodical version, let's say. Uh, You can read his work in billboard.com, access.com, that's AXS.com, in Variety, in Goldmine. um, He's adding new titles every week. And he's also the author of a book, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. Hello, Steve. Hello, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. And I hope, I hope... This will be the year that I get my my re- my bigger book done, and I, actually, I posted about that on uh, New Year's Eve. So, uh, cross, cross what your, is cross the bigger book? What is the bigger book? It's mm. going to be kind of a compilation of stuff I've written and interviews that okay. I have not written. In fact, I'm I'm woefully transcribing. I mean, I'm bogged down with transcribing, and uh, I, I've done a couple of really good ones um, that nobody has heard. Um, uh, so, yeah, this will be it'll be this will be interesting when I get it done. So, transcribing is a lot of work. It's yes, my I know. favorite thing more than having I, my wisdom teeth pulled out without <laughs> anesthetic. I know. I know it's a it's a can I, I can't say it, but it's a it's that. Yeah. It's definitely that. Anyway. Well, maybe maybe when I have my interviews transcribed, I'll, I'll call on you, Alan. Mm-hmm. You could help me out with that. So this week we're going to be talking about a perennial topic in Beatles listening and collecting, which is some of the differences between stereo and mono versions of their songs. Um, and we have broken it up, so we're just going to go through help, assuming we even get that far. And at some other point, may or may not be next week, we will do the rest of the catalog. Because there's lots and lots of fascinating stuff. But first, we will check in on some of the news. Um, The the first thing being that to pick up from last week, Ringo's impending knighthood was confirmed. So Steve, you have more to say about that? Yeah, um, it they uh they made the announcement uh um uh, january i think it was december uh 29th or 30th i think it was just december 30th and ringo was was honored for services to music which was interesting because some of the advance reports said music and charity but no it was just music and um he as as we as we said last week he he gets his knighthood twenty years after McCartney, and he of course was v- very pleased. He issued a statement. It's great. It's an honor and pleasure to be considered and acknowledged for my music and my charity work, both of which I love. Peace and love. McCartney uh, Paul McCartney posted congratulations the next day, saying huge congrats, Sir Ringo. Sir Richard Starkey has a nice ring to it. Best drummer, best pal, ex Paul, and I believe Yoko Ono. Uh, also congratulated him today. Uh, this is the the second. So, in any event, um, and I my st- the story I did for Billboard had a bunch of quotes from people, some of which I got on my own. Um, one from Mark Lewison, one from Ken Womack. Bruce uh, Sugar um, posted, uh, who is Ringo's recording engineer, posted on Friday. I couldn't be more proud and thrilled to see him get this prestigious award. Sir Richard is a constant inspiration for how he lives his life, showing us how to age gracefully in this youth-oriented business and how he carries himself with a healthy dose of humility and gratitude and his tireless promotion of peace, love, and goodwill. So there we go. Um, Well said. Well said. Yeah, I thought thought so too. Mm -hmm. Uh, If anybody knows Ringo really well, it's Bruce. Um, 
you know, he's he and he's and when you talk to him, he's very very complimentary about Ringo. Uh, as I mean, I've talked to other people too. I remember Edgar Winter was the same way, but Bruce I think was even more. Bruce has worked with him so close uh, that uh, you know he really knows how Ringo is. So it was really nice to see that, and it was well deserved too. So. Mm-hmm. Better. And also, and also, make sure that uh, we congratulate Barry Gibb, right? He's also yeah. getting knighted too. Barry Gibb's also getting knighted, which was a big surprise to me. I that I wasn't expecting that, and it's too bad that uh, Maurice and Robin aren't around because they probably would have been knighted as well. But um, congratulations to Barry Gibb. I mean, that's fantastic. Uh, that's really fantastic that he's getting knighted. Yeah, and if you read Barry's quote, he was saying that I'm accepting this award along with my brothers. Right. So making sure that they're represented as well. So. And uh, one other musician was uh, was honored, uh, not although not knighted, was Mark Allman of Soft Cell. Um, he got an OBE. So they didn't nom- they didn't uh, honor a whole bunch of musicians this year, but they did. I mean, obviously with Ringo, they. Got a biggie uh, and Barry too, so and that's fan- it's fantastic that they that they both got uh, knighted. Mm-hmm. Anyway, mm-hmm. okay, and there is some Denny Lane news too, I believe, right, Ken? Yeah, well, uh, about a month ago, we had learned about the inductees, the new inductees for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and they mentioned the Moody Blues, who I always said was like the the biggest. <sighs> most noticeable glaring omission although there's so many of them (laughs) but um i always thought that the moody blues deserved to be in there you know before anybody else because of how far back they go but um initially when the moody blues were announced it was the days of future past moody blues with uh justin hayward and, and john lodge that period onward without denny lane who was one of the founding members but since then, it has been announced that Denny will be inducted along with the other band members, and we're very happy for him. Uh, Denny was only in the band, though, for two to three years, so 1964 through 66. He was on the first album and a few uh, singles that followed, and that was it. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that Denny's getting in, but at the same time, I can't help but notice that He's getting in as a member of the Moody Blues, and yet he was in Wings from the very beginning to the very end, from 1971 through 1981, when the announcement was made about Wings disbanding. Mm -hmm. And um, Wings are not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's just Paul McCartney after the Beatles, and that incorporates everything. But Denny's not represented in that catalog, which is really a shame because he was along with Paul and Linda, the only member of Wings that was there from start to finish. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Wings really dominated the charts, the singles charts and albums charts in the 70s. So right. Right. You know, it's it's really ironic that he's in one band that he was in for a couple of years, and then one band that he was in from the very beginning to the end, and he's not in there. So oh, the, there's one thing I want to say about this, which is that there was an article in Billboard magazine about the fact that Denny's now being inducted, and it's all because several people were really pushing for this. Most notably, Little Steven, Hmm. Peter Asher was very instrumental in getting Denny in, and um, and Bruce Morrow, ironically, (laughs) uh, legendary DJ, New York DJ. So um, I think Peter had said something to the effect that if Denny's not getting in, then he, he couldn't really support this. So, um, you know, it's really nice to see that these three people felt so strongly about Denny and his contribution early on that that he's in there. Mm -hmm. So thanks to those three people. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And there is also a little bit of um, interesting bootleg news sort of going on. Although these days, I mean, bootlegs, what is a bootleg? There are no bootleg shops, really. And there's, you know, right. it's, it's hard to find physical ones. And um, you uh, often find things on YouTube, which is the case with this one, which is uh, 
basically the original version of the soundtrack for the Destiny game. I think they called it Music of the Spheres. And that has sort of just come out. Apparently it was going to be a CD, but when, was it Bungie, is that the name of the, the company? Mm-hmm. Uh, right. f- fell out with Martin O'Donnell and um, the, the other composer as well. There's a second composer and Paul who wrote this soundtrack. We don't know really how much Paul contributed to the orchestral part of it. Um, he provided uh, Hope for the Future, obviously, at the end. And that's on the end of this new version. So there is some Paul input one way or another. I mean, it's the the three of them are credited uh, as the composers of this, and it's out on YouTube. So look for it and uh, see what you think. There's a very good article about the whole thing on ArsTechnica.com mm-hmm. that talks about the leaking of it and everything like that, uh, if you're interested in reading. I mean, it doesn't say a whole heck of a lot, but it does It does give you the basic details of how it, of, of it getting out there and, and a little bit of the history. Not a whole lot, but a little bit of it. Uh, are, and, you, are you looking at that now? Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. Because we should mention the second composer's name has slipped my mind. I think it's Silvestri or something. Michael, Michael Sal- Salvatore. Oh, Salvatore, right. Right, okay. is, the, is the other composer um, and Marty O'Donnell. So, but uh, and it's been and the music has been confirmed as legitimate by O'Donnell and former Bungie creative director Joe Staten. So, okay, but uh, yeah, I guess it was so, posted. On, I guess it was posted on Christmas Day. But um, what did you guys it, think of the music? Um, it sounded like a typical soundtrack album, except for the end, which I, I mean, I. When I remember back when we uh, first were talking about Hope for the Future, when they released the mix, when McCartney released the mixes, I was really thrilled with Hope for the Future, and I still am. But it sounds kind of disjointed now, just it, the way it's tacked on at the end. I don't know. Um, but uh, we were just talking about this, and and it doesn't sound to me like there's a whole lot of McCartney influence through the rest of it. But but Alan, you said there is. Uh, apparently, I mean, from what I've read, he did contribute ideas to the orchestral soundtrack too. So, which are his, uh, we'll never know. Um, is right. A problem with a collaborative orchestral work, you know. Really, don't know, but supposedly he's part of the creative force there. Uh, you know. Right, and there, there's the Ars Technic article suggests gives suggestions on getting the thing released if people will. Bug Bungie, um, so you know. Hopefully, hopefully it'll maybe, maybe it'll happen. You know, but yeah. um, for the completest, for, for the, know, the people yeah, yeah. that have to have everything. But um, it was interesting when I listened to it because, you know, normally if you want to, if you want to compare it in any way to Paul's classical music, if you hear something that Paul's composed that's in the classical vein, in most cases without your being told. You're going to know it's Paul McCartney. <laughs> There's hmm. something about Paul's melodies right. where it's very distinctive, and and it's like if you heard the Liverpool Oratorio, but you were never told Paul wrote it, you'd know it was Paul. There are certain certain melodies that stand out that you you just hear and you automatically think it's Paul. You hear this music, and it's not structured like like a pop song or even the classical uh, works that Paul does, which have some kind of I don't want to call it formula, but, you know, repeated melodies, melodies that interweave mm-hmm. here and there. There's nothing like that here. It's well, like, that's oh, why... not a very beautiful music that doesn't repeat, and it's not like you'd hear it and say, oh, that's McCartney. Mm-hmm. That's you why know? I was saying at the beginning that it, it when you hear Hope for the Future at the end, it sound, it almost sounds like it was – an addition rather than you know the, the, there's no there's not the smoothness there that you would expect at least to my ears um but you know well, i mean, I mean if that, you have one thing that's a pop song and you put it at the end of a of orchestral soundtrack music it, i think it's almost got to sound like an addition like it's just an mm-hmm. addition i mean it's it's two kind of things that don't necessarily hang together that well i mean i i, I kind of right. thought it played into the into the song reasonably well um 
but I mean, I I played I played the the, the game, and I heard the music in the game, but I you know the hope for the future to my you know to the extent that I played the game, and I didn't go all the way through it, I it wasn't in there. So, but I'm glad you know that they've that they've done this um, and made that you know put the whole thing out or at least somebody has put the whole thing out and hopefully somebody will you know they'll put the whole thing out legitimately that would be nice i mean the orchestration is really nice though and uh very well produced yeah yeah i mean to me i mean you know what i'm not into games at all i can't think i've of ever having played a single game of any kind, and that includes Beatles Rock Band. My only interest in Beatles Rock Band was in cracking it so that we could get at those multi-tracks. Um, <laughs> you know, as a game, who cares? Um, and with Destiny, I mean, I was interested in the track Paul contributed, and I was mm-hmm. interested in the fact that he was supposed to have contributed to the orchestral stuff, but I never had any intention of playing the game. I mean, I just sort of knew that somebody would get that music out there, and if it wasn't Bungie, it was going to be someone else. And indeed, when the game originally came out, there was a different version of the soundtrack that's just come out, you know, so that someone recorded right out of the game and put Mm -hmm. online. Um, And so this is an earlier version um, that I... I I gather uh Martin O'Donnell feels is in a way more authentic, you know. He had a he and Bungie had a parting of ways just before the game came out, I believe, and um so there's there are obviously some some feelings there that uh is sort of beyond my purview. Um but mm-hmm. um yeah, you know, I I the, the whole game thing, I mean, come on. Um the thing is that that also with with Destiny, okay, you know, it's one thing if you're playing the game and seeing the, you know, what is it, space monsters? I mean, who the hell knows? Uh, and you hear the soundtrack go with that, and you've played it, Steve. You have some idea whether it even means anything. To me, just listening to this orchestral score, it sounds a little bit faceless, I have to say. Um, it's, not a, it's not a monsters game. So that's, you know, one thing to make clear. It's not one of those... It's one of these conquering the. You're battling people, but it's like you're in a you're in a cave. At least that's as far as I got. I didn't like I said I didn't get through the whole game. My son, I think got, I, know, I think my son got through it more than I did, but, but uh, I, I didn't get through it. So yeah, whatever. So the big question was: Was it in mono or in stereo? <laughs> it was in stereo. Okay. Okay. Like the version of Please Please Me that has the lyric mistake in it. Right. <laughs> right. That was a that was my attempt at a segue. I, I don't know if oh, that worked. Okay. <laughs> it's very smooth, Alex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um so shall we take these chronologically and in, in which case yeah, let's, Please let's Please Me would Please Please Me would be first because even though the stereo didn't come out until the album um the song was out, at least in mono, first. So, start with that, or do you want to start with the album itself? Well, I, the- I think that we should make reference to the fact that, you know, back in when the when the Beatles first put the uh, C- put their CDs out, those first four albums were only in mono. Um, and actually, you can talk about that a little bit. Because you talked to George Martin, Alan. Right. Uh, and, okay. Okay, and, so, and, you know, the, the background to that, in a way, is that, I mean, I don't know if you had the same experience as me, but I remember, you know, we got stuff in stereo and mono, but we considered, we meaning American collectors, I guess, um, mm-hmm. uh, considered the stereo catalog to be the primary catalog, partly because the mono had gone out of print, you know, I mean, we got the mono albums as kids, or I did, um, and then, you know, we did what we considered upgrading to stereo, but there were, you know, all through, up until CD came out, there were always a bunch of tracks that were not available in stereo, or they would turn up on a 
Japanese EP, like I'm down, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, it was that, uh, this boy, I mean, a number of them, I think there were really, it got down to four or five, um, (laughs) that just had never turned up in stereo. And those were like the things everybody was looking for. And I remember before the CDs came out when, uh, EMI had announced that they, we're going to put them even me. I think before the announcement, I had lunch with an EMI producer named John Curlander, who worked with the Beatles late in their career. And he was still working for EMI. Um, but I was having lunch with him after a classical session that he produced with the Philadelphia orchestra. And I said, you know, my, my big sort of worry about the Beatles CDs when they come out is that they're going to come out only either in stereo or in mono and collectors really need both versions. Um, and he said, no, no, I'm sure they'll come out in both. And, you know, yeah, well, this was in maybe 1986 or so we had that conversation. It it took till 2009 to put out both versions complete. When they put out the first four CDs, I was just astonished that they went with mono because I figured that EMI considered mono a you know a dead letter you know all their mono hey. stuff was out of print and they came up with this idea that the Beatles only cared about mono and I still don't buy that um, they may have primarily cared about mono for much of their career. But the fact is those records came out originally in both formats. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed George Martin and I asked him why. And this, that was my very first question. And his very first answer was not, well, you see the Beatles preferred mono. It was, well, they originally had done them in stereo and they gave them to me to say, haven't we done a wonderful job? And I listened to them and they, I never intended them to be out in stereo, even though he did put them out in stereo. (laughs) And so I told them, no, they sound awful. Um, If you're going to put them out in stereo, you've got to do a proper remix. Um, And and that should only be Hard Day's Night and Beatles for Sale. The first two were two track recordings. They really should be out just in mono. And Mm -hmm. that was his reasoning. And he said the reason they put them out in mono is not because they had any feeling about the historical propriety of mono. It was that they, once he said, you got to redo these, they said, well, you know what? We can't. We definitely don't have the time to let you remix the third and fourth albums. If you want to start with Help and Rubber Soul, you can. But, you know, we're not revisiting those. Why? Well, it's 1987, and in June 1987, Sgt. Pepper will have its 20th anniversary, and we have to have an ad campaign that says it was 20 years ago today, so Sgt. Pepper must be out on June 1st, 1987. And if we mess around with the earlier ones, that will ruin the schedule for Sgt. Pepper. So it was that very, very important concern that the ad had to be right. (laughs) But why couldn't they have put A Hard Day's Night and Beatles for Sale out in stereo and just leave the first two in mono, like you suggested? Because um, it would have taken too much time and it would have thrown off their schedule and Sgt. Pepper wouldn't have been out on June 1st. Uh, This is their thinking. I I can't answer for it, really. (laughs) But here's the... Well, they should have started earlier. They They should have, yes. Yes, 1987 was four years into the CD format. So, they, yeah, they were coming late to the party in the first place. But going into what you said earlier, Alan, about um, the fact is that they'd been out in stereo. And, And even though the mixes were terrible, I mean, because they, you know, the way they separated on these earlier albums. You know, um, I mean, they they still had them out there, and they 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 weren't rare by any 
stretch of the imagination. Right. I mean, I had I had picked up back in those days. I had picked up the A tracks, the Parlophone A tracks. Yeah. Um, well, they they originally had Jeff Emmerich remix all. F- redo all four or at least transfer I don't know if he actually remixed do them in stereo and they played Mm -hmm. those to George Martin and he hated them now George Martin the first mention I have been able to find of his dislike of the early stereo was in 1976 when the rock and roll album came out Mm -hmm. Um, he listened to it and he told Rolling Stone you know I listened to this and and some idiot took the two track masters and put them out as if there was a stereo mix, but there was no stereo mix. And so that was when I found, I believe you have it up on your Abbey Road site still. Uh, I think you illustrated it with the ads, right? I found ads. I, I in, think so. Yeah, in the Beatles 1963 touring books, you know, the program books people could buy at a concert. I found mm-hmm. an ad that showed Please Please Me. It showed a picture of the stereo cover, you know, says stereo up on the corner, and it gives the catalog numbers for both mono and stereo, and with the Beatles had not been released yet, but was coming soon. So they had a little flag over it saying something like coming soon, and they also showed the stereo cover and gave the stereo and mono catalog numbers. So I showed George Martin these, and he said, well, you know, you you have me at a disadvantage here. Um, All I can tell you is in those days, I didn't have time to eat breakfast, let alone know what was was going out. But the thing is that on the sheets, the EMI, you know, the Parlophone uh, session sheets and mixing sheets, he's listed as the producer of the stereo mixes. Mm-hmm. So who knows? Um, those things right. came out in stereo. Whether the Beatles, you know, we know that the Beatles didn't turn up at mixing sessions until, you know, well into the process. Uh, Might have been Help or, or even um, Rubber Soul, but mm-hmm. um, but they definitely were made both ways. Uh, the fact that the market in England was small for pop albums and stereo, you know, okay, fine, but they came out at the time. Right. They were not right. later mixes. So, yeah. But did they only make the stereo mixes on those early albums because they felt they had to, not because they not because they wanted to? Um you know, I don't know. Do, do record companies do things that they have to that they don't want to? I mean, EMI took 4 years to get into CD. And before that, I mean, it took them a while to get into LP. (laughs) I mean, they were, the EMI as a company has always been very slow to embrace any kind of change. So if the market for pop albums in England in stereo was that dismal, why would they have felt they had to? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm. it's one of those things that, you know, it, 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 it seems like something you should be able to get to the bottom of, but there's a lot of, I think, misinformation out there and a lot of misinformation that has been put out there in the service of justifying some marketing decision, you know, or some person's preference. Did the Beatles prefer mono? Yeah, probably. I mean, John uh, talked about some of the bad stereo mixes he had heard uh, in some of his interviews, and particularly Revolution. He hated yep. the stereo mix of Revolution. And I and I, I think that in a way, it's that this is one of the good things about what Giles Martin was trying to do to some degree on Pepper, which is to, and, and also on the one album, which is to find a stereo mix that somehow has the punch that the mono mixes had. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think I always like the early stereo mixes because as a, you know, young musician, it let me turn off the vocals and hear what was going on on the guitar arrangements and the bass line and, and the drums. And, you know, you could hear it in a way that it was harder to hear in mono. You could hear it, obviously. But if you wanted to focus on a guitar line, and you could turn the vocals off, it made it much easier. And and the same way if you wanted to figure out what they were doing in a vocal arrangement, because their vocal arrangements were so fantastic, you could turn the instrumentals off, 
you know, and it wasn't mm-hmm. totally off. I mean, there was a little bit of bleeding on either side, you know, it wasn't as if That's it was... true. So, yeah, so... It's uh, interesting how you bring that up, because a musician hears things differently than, you know, the common fan would, music fan, so... Yeah, it could be. Yeah, so, I mean, I got to admit, you know, uh, I saw her standing there in nice, punchy mono mix is just great, but I still want to hear the other one, too, mm-hmm. you know? Mm. So, should we get back to specifics? Let's do that. Okay. Well, let's start with Please Please Me, because, you know, that has a, a very obvious difference in the mono and stereo, which is uh, the the vocal line. You know, and uh, it obviously was a mistake that got into the stereo mix, uh, and and it's and it's this kind of thing that I believe leads people to say, you know, well, so you see, this one has a mistake. No one even no one even noticed. You know, obviously the mono is better, but I would counter that by saying, well, okay, if you listen to what goes on, you can hear that in stereo they put the lead guitar in at the end and they seem to have forgotten to do that in mono. So Mm -hmm. there you go. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, the question then becomes, and I hate to jump anywhere past the help album. Okay. But when, when, when the white album came out in mono on vinyl a few years ago, there was a listening session in New York city that I attended and Ken Scott was there Mm -hmm. And I asked him the question, why are there all these differences between the mono and the stereo? And Ken said to me, a lot of those were just mistakes. So, you know, there's a part of me that thinks rationally, these are artistic decisions that were made. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But sometimes they weren't. Yeah. So, you know, you wonder sometimes between all these differences that there's a vocal here that's that's in the mono but not in the stereo or... You know, you could talk about From Me to You, which has the harmonica intro and the mono, but it doesn't have it in the stereo, and why is it that way? Sometimes I have to question, what were those artistic decisions where it was knowingly done, or were they mistakes sometimes? Yeah, George Martin told me that it, it, it it's not something they thought about all that much. It's like each each mix was, in a way, a performance, and they went in and they did it, and if it didn't match absolutely, it didn't matter. And, you know, it was this, this wasn't even the same conversation as the original four CDs. I mean, this is something that I've, in all the times I've interviewed, and we've always gotten back to these things, and... He said, uh, I thought it was very interesting, actually. He said, you know, people get awfully upset about these differences, but, you know, we were just sort of doing it. We didn't really think that it had to absolutely match. And I said, you know, I don't think people are upset about it. I think that collectors are fascinated with it. You know, the fact that you can have two versions of a Beatles recording and they're different is just something that we kind of love to hear. And he said, ah, sort of like an extra reel on a coin. And I thought, okay, now he gets it, because he's obviously a coin collector. Only a coin collector would say that, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, it's, it's a little like that. It's a little like coin mm. collecting, but more interesting. <laughs> okay. Okay. Apologies to any coin collectors out there. Okay. Mm. But if you're listening to this show, you agree. (laughs) So with these first two albums, I just want to ask the two of you, do you have a preference between the mono and the stereo? You kind of answered that already, Alan, but I still want to hear how both of you feel about it. How about you, Steve? Well, you know, it's interesting back then because when the CDs came out, I wasn't really into the mono mixes and I'm maybe it was because they were the those CDs were a little fl- flat i mean flat sounding do you guys do you guys agree with that do they yeah. sound a little flat to you mm-hmm. but and and so at the time i think i i happened to find some japanese sets with with stereo mixes and i actually really liked those but in listening to them now, in the stereo versions and in the mono versions, uh, I think the technology has brought the mono versions sounding much better. I, you know, I noticed that after 
you know, after listening to the the white mono album set, you know, you that it, they definitely sound they definitely sound better now than they did before. The instrumentation sounds more distinct than they did before on those first four albums. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I, I maybe that doesn't make any sense, but the the mix do sound better now. Do you guys agree? Um, I think transferring technology has improved a bit, but basically on both the 2009 ones and the 1987 ones, all they did was transfer the master tape to CD. Mm -hmm. So it's really a question of, you know, what their transferring equipment was, what EQ they were using. I mean, two different people can come up with a different sounding uh, Hmm. disc. But, you know, I, I, I agree with you that the, you know, the mono... When the mono box came out, the mono LP box, um, Mm -hmm. I got that and just sat there. I don't know, maybe it was over two or three nights, but just played them chronologically. Now we're talking about great pressings, you know, Mm -hmm. really good, clean pressings, not like you would buy in the early 80s where they were, you know, as if they were done on you know tinfoil or something um Mm -hmm. these were great and i absolutely loved listening to the whole collection in mono i I just thought it was great that said you know still my go-to set is the stereo one i think Hmm. Hmm. yeah well for me um uh, overall in the entire beatles catalog i always go for the stereo but i do like the first two in mono better only because I don't like hearing the vocals in one channel and the drums and guitars in the other channel, even though there is that little bit of bleed through, as you mentioned, Alan. I just think that most of our lives, we're so used to hearing lead vocals centered in both channels. There's something wrong (laughs) when you hear it in one channel. It's one thing if it's being done for an effect for a few seconds, but throughout an entire song, to hear lead vocals in one channel kind of bothers me. Hmm. Um, But that being said, it all depends on where you're listening to this music. If you're you're in a room where the speakers are very close to each other, it's not that bad in stereo. When I listen in my headphones, it really starts to bother me after a while because it's very formula throughout the whole, well, the first two albums are that way. So every single song, you've got the the lead vocals in one channel and the the drums and the guitars in the other. So that gets kind of annoying after a while, if you're listening that way. If you're listening where the speakers are spread apart, I'd much rather listen in mono. I don't like that kind of separation. But I could also see, it's really interesting that you brought that up, Alan, because a musician looks for those things, for the separation where they can really pick apart the instrumentation. So I can understand why you like it for that reason. Um, you know, when I said that to George Martin in that first interview uh, about th- about the first four CDs, uh, he said, "Well, y- you would want to come in and listen to the multi tracks." <laughs> I said, "Yes, please," but, but but then he didn't invite me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so yeah. You know, Ken, get, getting with what you were saying, I, I kind of feel almost the opposite because I have, you know, I I I really like, for example, what Giles did with the. Uh, with the one plus and the one mixes, I thought those were really good. And listening, you know, I, I mean, I often listen in my car, and I I know that's not you know that's not the same as you know listening on a on a you know high tech stereo. But still, um, I enjoy I enjoy the the stereo mixes in the car. Now, when I'm listening in headphones, for example. The mono, uh, you know, I like the mono. Uh, I think the, you really can. There's a closeness there. You really feel the, the, um, I don't know the, uh, I'm, I don't know what I'm trying to trying to describe. Maybe you, you guys can probably guess what you know, figure out what I'm trying to say. But there's a maybe there's a more intimacy, in, a little more intimacy there, with the okay. mono, than the stereo. I was uh, only referring to the first two, in mono. I prefer the first two in mono. Mm-hmm overall but the rest of the catalog i for the most part prefer in stereo so but they both have their merits so you know there are times when i prefer to just listen in mono but most of the time i'm fine with the stereo mixes partly because those are the ones that i've been so used to my whole life right so your ears are trained to hear it that way and you're fine with it 
Yeah. Well, for example, there, I mean, there's a couple of obvious differences between the mono and stereo. Um, the the please please me where John screws up the line, and and I should have known better where they screw up the harmonica. I mean, those are, you know, you can't help but miss the. You can't help you know uh, catch those. Yeah. You money, know, but, since we're talking about the first two albums, Money has, uh, you know, sounds completely different, Mono mm-hmm. and Stereo. Uh, that supposedly was the first thing they were able to do on four track. No, they did on Hold Your Hand. I want to hold your hand. Um, yeah. And that was, let's look at the dates here. Yeah, that was two weeks before. Hmm. No, actually, Money was recorded first, way first. Mm hmm. And then they return to it at the end of September, but that's still a couple of weeks before on a hold your hand. Yeah, I mean the the intro, for instance, is is totally different. Um, the mono, I think, has more of a guitar in the mix, and the stereo more piano, or I have them backwards. I'm not sure which. And I think maybe the mono is more piano. But they sound, you know, yeah. I mean, even though it's essentially the same recording, it is a totally different mix. And it was, I think, pretty surprising, you know, when you first ran into it. And I didn't run into it at the time. I mean, I, I had the mono album as a kid and were, were the mono Meet the Beatles, really, as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I didn't actually... When was the first time you each noticed differences between mono and stereo? Do you remember? Well, in my case, I mean, I grew up basically with mono albums. So all the vinyls I saw, including Pepper, were mono. Mm-hmm. I because we didn't have a stereo. So it wasn't until, you know, it wasn't until I don't know, uh probably the, the 80s, 70s, no, I'll say I'll say 70s that I'd ever heard any stereo Beatles because I never had, you know, when I was when I was growing up, my parents only had a mono record player. It wasn't until I moved out away from home that I finally got, you know, a stereo record player or mm-hmm. stereo, you know, stereo anything. So, you know, uh, and once I started going around to record stores and seeing the the import albums, you know, especially the uh the Parlophone albums, you know, I grabbed those and and you know, I started discovering that stuff. So f- for me, it was kind of like hearing mono for a long time and then all of a sudden discovering stereo. And there's still that kind of discovery thing. Not I wouldn't say discovery thing, but there's still that kind of excitement when hearing those um, because they always sounded rather fresh, mm-hmm. you know. But still, there's the mono when the mono box set came out when that cd set came out it was that was like rediscovering the whole thing all over again and hearing how how good that stuff was mm-hmm. you know the same thing same thing happened and and i i'd recommend this too if you know for people who who can afford it is the rolling stones mono box right that is awesome that is really really awesome so mm-hmm. yeah i mean they're the 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 same thing there. In fact, the I, I wouldn't say so much with the Beatles because the there's a power in the in both the mono and the stereo, but definitely with the Stones, the mono mixes are so much better, so much better. Mm-hmm. So, so Ken, when did you okay. first notice the differences between mono and stereo? Well, as a kid and as a teenager, I never paid much attention. It didn't really. I didn't really have an interest in it. It was only really when the Beatles' Rarities album came out, they pointed out a few differences, saying Helter Skelter and, and Don't Pass Me By, or uh, the extra couple of bars and I Am the Walrus, that I started to notice these different versions. Hmm. But still, I've never been so actively involved in discovering the mono. I have it. I listen to it. I don't feel very passionate about the mono over the stereo. Yeah. I like to have it there so I can listen to it whenever I feel like it. But I do like noticing the differences. But it's not like I say to myself, gee, I, I feel more like mono Beatles for sale today. You know, it's not yeah. like I ever think that way. Right. Most of the time I go for the stereo. But um, usually with the first two, the first two albums, I go for the mono. Okay. But, you know. Yeah. You know, I mean, I didn't first notice it until the 70s. I mean, I, I I knew that Please Please Me had a mistake in stereo that it didn't have on the single. 
that much I noticed. Then there were certain other things I noticed, but it, it never really occurred to me that there would be just big mixing differences until uh, at one point, I think it was uh, either I was still in school or had just graduated and was listening to uh, a British EP that had Dr. Robert on it. And the backing vocals, um, you know, well, 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 you're feeling fine. I mean, on mono in the U.S. and stereo in the U.S., because, you know, apart from there being mono and stereo mixes, there are different mixes in different countries. Um, mm -hmm. That backing vocal to me just sounded like, you know, well, 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 you're feeling fine. But there's a counter melody going... Well, 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 you're feeling, you know, it goes up and down the scale. And that is very prominent in the British mono mix. And I was playing that and heard that and said, what is going on? And then started playing all the mono stuff that I had stopped listening to when I upgraded, quote, upgraded to stereo years earlier and began, you know, really noticing lots and lots of things. Plus, you know, I was going out and getting all the parlophones, and so I began getting them in mono and stereo instead of just stereo, which would have been my inclination. And it's, you know, it's it's just become a fascinating thing. I mean, on the, since we're to starting to start with the first two albums, there really are only those couple of differences, I think, you know, unless you're talking about something like uh, the mono fades two seconds longer than the stereo, which to me is a, a very minor difference. But mm -hmm. um, you really got just please, please me with the lyric mistake and money with the sort of instrumental differences. Um, mm -hmm. And then in between there, you've got from me to you and thank you, girl, both of which are different in stereo mm -hmm. than in mono, and both because of the harmonica, you know, the edit pieces that they put in, um, mm -hmm. different ways in the different mixes. And since those were singles, I mean, I, I can buy that, yeah, the, the stereo for that was an afterthought. Okay, fine, you know, but uh, it, it just is kind of interesting. I, I, I think on both of those, probably the mono is preferable although thank you girl i like the the way the um so which is it that has the thank you girl has harmonica in different places like in the middle and end they're there in stereo but they're not there in mono i mm -hmm. kind of right. like i kind of like them there <laughs> so and in stereo it is at the end the yeah harmonica. right right so and it's so strange because from me to you, it was the opposite. Right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> from me to you had the, had the harmonica, but I, it, the, the mono version had the harmonica in the intro and the stereo didn't. Yeah. So. You, you begin to get more, oh, I, I should say, uh, you know, we'd said there was only the, you know, on, on With the Beatles, only money. But um, if you consider the German With the Beatles... And all my lovin'. Actually, all my lovin' was it that way on with the Beatles or just on one of the greatest hits albums in Germany with the hi hat intro that is that was just that, that was just the German, I believe. Wasn't Tensile it that way in Canada? I don't mm, think so. No. Um, here we no. have um, German. Yeah, the German with the Beatles did have the hi hat, the hi -hat. and That's otherwise right. the German and some Dutch. Uh, Greatest Hits albums had it, but uh, not in Canada, apparently. Right. Okay. Yeah. I should point, we should point out there are some resources for this. Um, there is Joseph Brennan's Usenet Guide to the Beatles Recording Variations. Um, it's a little out of date and can't say I 100% agree with all the differences he hears, um, but okay. Uh, there's also a book called every little thing um, that's the best title for a book i think yeah you know they should make a radio yeah. show <laughs> right right yeah um think about that. Yeah. that was mitch mcgeary and there was it wasn't a co-author i'm looking at it now actually let me see i don't think so i think it was okay. just let me see mitch mcgeary and william mccoy yes it was right. actually yeah 
So that originally came out for, you know, those of you of a certain age, like me, uh, a lot of us first got that as basically a glorified pamphlet. I mean, it was a very thin eight by 11 thing with a yellow cover with a picture of the Beatles on it. I believe it was like a very like Abbey Road era picture of the Beatles. And it was very concise and it went through all the mono and stereo mixes and some of the foreign mixes. The book version was put out by the late great Pyrian Press, and I actually didn't like the book version that much for some reason. It it just seemed very padded out with things like, uh, you know, the Mexican mix, the Mexican mono mix is one second shorter than, you know, whatever. And and that that to me seemed like such a minor difference that wasn't worth even cataloging but nevertheless you know but you know there's always going to be people in this world that care about those things so. that's right that's right <laughs> and more power to them mm. so beyond that let's move on to hard days night you begin to get lots of stereo mono differences um i think steve mentioned the harmonica on i should have known better mm-hmm. um and let's see yeah yeah there's the harmonica sort of cuts out in the middle of it. It's right. like he does it in two phrases instead of continuously. And, this, and that's stereo. The mono is a sort of continuous performance. Uh, and I love her. That has some differences, too. Did I leave this to you guys? Um, well, if I remember, the, the mono version is single-tracked with mm-hmm. Paul's vocals, and the, the stereo is double-tracked. Right. Yeah, and there's yeah, the a, same same thing with "If I Fell" uh, with, and there's with a, Jones. But wait, there is also a German difference. <laughs> mm-hmm. Germans seem to like having a little bit extra, like they had those four hi hat, those five hi hat tabs on "All My Lovin'," and mm-hmm. in "And I Love Her," instead of it ending with you know four do 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 do, they have six. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, and the big question is, you know, it, 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 it obviously, they didn't play it that way, I don't think. I think that was, it was looped in by the German label Odeon to make it six. And you got to wonder what that discussion was, you know? <laughs> yeah. It was like, okay, they sent us one with only four of them at the end, but do we think it really needs six? <laughs> mm-hmm. Call Dieter in to edit two more on. <laughs> so, anyway, let's what... let's mess everyone else's mind with this. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, well, you know, speaking of that, Ken, uh, there, there was another thing that, <laughs> that Ken Scott said, and I'm not sure if he said it to you or, or if it was in his book. Um, but at one point, he discussed the stereo mono differences, and he said that. Paul told him he wanted the differences as they were not to be fixed because people would buy both versions. Now that seems I remember that. I remember yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to me a little early for that. I mean, there wasn't a lot of talk of stereo and mono differences back when the Beatles were still a going concern. But uh maybe you know, later on, maybe for the White Album. Yeah. I believe he was specifically talking about the White Album actually. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so Steve, you were starting to talk about If I Fell. Well, the, that one has the same situation where the the uh, vocal uh, is double tracked in stereo. John's intro is double tracked in stereo with, and it's single tracked in mono. Mm-hmm. And then Paul's voice cracks in the second vein in stereo, but it's it doesn't crack in mono, which is kind of right. weird. Huh. So. Hmm. Yep. Hmm. And that's something I noticed as a little kid. Yeah. <laughs> I picked that out. Yeah. You know? Whether or not my brain thought, oh, that's the stereo version and there's a mono one where it's perfect, I don't know. But I remember hearing and and, and noticing Paul's voice crack back then. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. Um, on to the EP that came out after Hard Day's Night or around the time of Hard Day's Night. Uh, Brennan notes that uh, the mono... Uh, well, there was, he lists several mono and stereo mixes uh, and gives the dates for them. It's it's very handy. Um, and uh, it turns out that 
one of the mono mixes apparently has, and, and I, I didn't go back to check, has echo that the other mono mix doesn't, and that was the big difference there. And strangely enough, it was not the U.S. one that has echo. It was hmm. Parlophone. The EP has more echo than the Capitol Beatles second album and the Canadian Long Tall Sally album. Hmm. There's a shocker. <laughs> <laughs> it was just to make us buy, make us Americans buy the the imports. That's all it was. Yes. Well, and Dave Dexter made up for it by putting extra, extra, extra echo on all mm-hmm. of Beatles '65. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So, I Call Your Name is another of those that has... Uh, okay, so Brennan lists four mixes of that, two, two stereo, two mono. But this is one of those songs where, you know, people argue about whether the cowbell comes in earlier on this one, or later on that one. And mm-hmm. uh, the cowbell's definitely an issue here. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> any thoughts about it? Not particularly, although I know, I'm looking at the Brennan entry while we're sitting here and he's also talking about another uh a mono mix for the film which uh um for a hard day's night which is interesting i guess it's for a hard day's night yeah it says that uh, there was a mono mix for the film okay yeah but since the song wasn't used it didn't right. get used either right so, so yeah you know i mean i you know i call your name i i, I once did a, a piece for for um, when Tower Records had a, a magazine called Pulse, I did a piece about Beatles collecting and a lot of the stereo and mono differences. And I got a call from this guy out in California when I was living in New York. And it wasn't me. And it wasn't you. <laughs> and he wanted to talk about mono and stereo mixes. And he, he said, so, so how many mixes of... I call your name, can you think of? And I said, well, I know it's mono and stereo. And he said, no, there are, there are three, because the UK mono is different from the US mono, because there's an extra cowbell, and then there's a woo before the guitar solo. And I thought, uh, well, okay, um, yeah. So we got, I got off the phone, and I went in to talk to my wife, and I said, uh, you know, this, this guy called me, and he's certifiable. And she listen to my repeating the conversation. He says, she said, well, what do you mean he's certifiable? This sounds to me just like you. <laughs> I said, well, the, the difference is, I guess, that I wouldn't call someone who I didn't know 3,000 miles away to say that. I guess it's a fine distinction. Now I'm saying it on a podcast. <laughs> You got a, you got a call from an Eddie Deason impersonator. <laughs> it, it actually did sound like Eddie Deason. <laughs> Maybe it really? was Eddie Deason. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so let's see. Tell me why. Mm, not significant differences. No. Um, Although it's a, my, the list I have here says very noticeable noticeable reverb in stereo, not heard in the mono. I'm not sure. Well, I mean, with the with the Beale sixty five album, it's really, you know, you can't help but notice it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know, in, when it comes down to mono and stereo mixes, a little more reverb, a little less less reverb, um, certain instruments being a little louder or not. I, those to me are not really significant differences i mean yeah i don't i don't think you can count you can count the reverb i mean it's it's hard you, i think you have to make a distinction between the reverb mixes and the stereo and the real stereo mixes right you know i because you know as we've all said you know all along those are fake stereo mixes you know and that you know so mm-hmm. well anyway uh, there is I'll Cry Instead, where um, the one on the United Artists album had a verse, really just a looped-in verse. It's not something mm-hmm. that we don't hear elsewhere in the song, but it's longer than all the other versions because the, cause they did that looping in. I guess they were having a competition with the Germans. I guess. Um, and and I, I think they won because looping in a verse is is a bit more than looping in two guitar outro phrases for and i love her 
But um, and that was the one. That was the one they uh, that MPI tagged on the front of the original Hard Day's Night DVD. Yes and no. Apparently, yes they, and no? apparently they made a new stereo mix for that. Oh, did, but okay. but with the extraverse looped in. So okay, yeah. That was the version I grew up on. <laughs> I was used to the longer version. Really? Yeah. That very long, two minutes and four seconds. You know. Yeah, I I, I remember that very well too. I mean, oh, yeah. that, uh, every time, every time I hear that, uh, you can't, you can't. Uh, that's the one I think of automatically. So. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not even sure I had the Hard Day's Night album growing up. I think I sort of made do with something new and the singles. Um, really? Yeah, I think I got the Hard Day's Night album later. Hmm. Um, but, you know, so that was a big discovery once I got it. Hey, this version's longer, you know. Okay, so let's see. Slow Down. Slow Down yeah. also has... A vocal error um, in the double tracking where on one version on one pass of the vocal John is singing uh, now she's got a boyfriend down the street and on the other one he says now you don't care a dime for me and weirdly enough that is available in both the mono and stereo versions <laughs> I thought it was just one or the other but I listened to them both today and there it was. Weird, huh? Weird. I know that um, the stereo at the very end, John goes woo at the end. Yeah. And it's not it's not on the mono. Mm. Yes, there is a lot of woo counting to be done in this <laughs> mono and stereo business. Our okay. next show will just be on the woos in Beatles songs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, when I get home, I think on there um, there's also some double tracking differences. Right. Um, those again seem kind of minor, but uh, you know if you're if you're really into this, you, you know anything you can pick out is uh, is worth the effort. <laughs> My list here says um, the word walk is stretched out on the mono till mm. I walk out that door. Right. Right. So, yeah, that's right. Then there's the shorter one. Mm -hmm. So, hmm. because sometimes I, you, know, you know, sometimes they actually just use different takes in mono and stereo, which accounts for some right. of these differences. I mean, sort of. I obviously. mean, but something something like that would have been, you know, I'm not sure everybody would have picked up on that one. That's that's a that's not an easy one to you know, especially at that point in the song to nail down, you know. Yeah. But anyway, all right. Okay, so we're running out of time. So let's let, let's have a quick look at uh, first Beatles for sale. Anything significant there, guys? That you that you hear? No, not really. Um, my I'm, list here has some someone is tapping on the guitar in the intro in the mono mix, and not in the stereo. I don't know. Of, that, of what? That might have been, <laughs> of, uh, every every little thing. Every little thing, oh. yeah. that, that kind of thing. I mean, it's also I feel fine not on the album, but it's r the related single. Uh, there is the quote hi hat version, uh, another quote hi hat version, uh, which is like right before the feedback. You can hear the hi hat close, and you can hear some okay. whispering. Um, and I think that one is just in stereo, uh, but a lot of I think it was like a a, a trim that was supposed to have been done that someone let out a little early someone cut the tape a little bit late um <laughs> is it is it the mono version of i feel fine longer a little bit i'm not sure about that but the mono version of words of love is a startling nine seconds longer yes okay at the end uh just goes you ever on. notice that whenever whenever there are longer versions of beatles songs they're always the mono versions yeah pretty mm -hmm. much hmm so beyond that, I don't see much on Beatles for sale, but when we get to help, there's the title song, which has some right. major differences. Um, mm -hmm. which, which of you would like to pick up on that? Ken? Uh, sure. Well, the single, which when the single came out, it was the mono version, and it actually had a different lead vocal from John. Mm-hmm. 
and um, Rascal. I'm trying to remember exactly. Yeah, but you could obviously it, radio has played the stereo version all these years, and you're so used to it that when you hear the mono one, it's start. It's very different, mm-hmm. starting mm-hmm. different. But um, there's one point where John's singing now. I now I find I've changed my mind. The way he sings it in both versions is different. Right. I have every little thing in front of me, and it says, in mono, John sings the third line as, now and now these days are gone, I'm not so self-assured. In stereo, he changes the word to now, but now these days are gone. And it says, also in mono, John phrases each word in the line, now I find I've changed my mind evenly, but in the stereo, he runs the last three words, now I find I've changed my mind. So he does it. He does the last three words quicker. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. There is, of course, a third version. The one in the film. Uh-huh. The one in the film is different than either the mono or the stereo. It's mostly the mono version, but the intro is different in the film version than the others. And um, that was one of those mysteries that uh, was solved through photography. Ryan and Kihu, in their book Recording the Beatles, went to a photographer who had shots of them recording at, uh, at CTS overdubbing, you know, the vocal overdubbing for the film, um, mm-hmm. and found them around a microphone in their, basically in their concert positions with John alone, George and Paul together, and they're holding a piece of paper. And George Martin is is present and uh ryan and kihu were saying well first of all why are they standing that way and maybe this is supposed to be to overdub the dialogue of the film and why is george martin there he's not needed for that and they looked at the the copy uh, the the piece of paper that john i think was holding and they enlarged it and you know did the contrast on it and then flipped around the image and you could see that it was the lyrics of help. And for some reason, George Martin wanted the intro redone or something like that. And so they ended up, they, they only had time to do it during that dialogue over dubbing session at CTS Studios. And so that's why that one is different. Weird, right? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, anything cool. else on the help album we need to get to? My list has um, there's a longer fade out on in stereo on Ticket to Ride. This is my, the list I have. I'm not. I'm not. I, I, I haven't. I picked up this list, so I haven't. I, I can't say I've confirmed every one of these, but uh, it says it's it's longer in stereo. So. Okay, so we've made it basically through help. If any of you have comments of, of, about things that we've missed, um, we, we didn't do absolutely every minor variation, but one man's minor variation is another's major variation. So feel free to let us know. We will pick up with Rubber Soul at some point in the future. And in the meantime, um, why don't we each say how we can be reached. I'm easy. Uh, can get me through Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And Ken? Uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. And my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. I just want to briefly mention that uh, as we're recording this show, we're doing this on January the 2nd. Tomorrow on the 3rd, we'll mark what would have been George Martin's 92nd birthday. So I'm doing something really special on my website. I'm doing a special contest in which you can win three George Martin prizes. And you're all wondering what they are, aren't you? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, there's one prize I haven't given away on my website, and that's the documentary of Soundbreaking, which came out the end of uh, 2016. It was shown on PBS channels. It's all about the evolution and innovations in popular music and recorded music. And um, it is said to be the very last project that George Martin worked on, for which he is listed as executive producer. It's a three DVD box set that I'm giving away. And I'm going to have three winners on my contest that will win the soundbreaking DVD box set. But in addition to that, there'll be one grand prize winner that will also win... Ken Womack's book on George Martin called Maximum Volume, which uh, came out last year. We did a great interview with Ken 
I also did one for my show and on my website. And then there's the other uh, release of last year, which was a CD from the Berlin Music Ensemble, which was all George Martin music that he composed. And um, this is his film music. And uh, it, they're all new recordings of his music, like the music from Yellow Submarine and uh, Live and Let Die, and also some stuff that has never been released before. And um, the actual CD is called The Film Scores and Original Orchestral Music of George Martin. So one person, a grand prize winner, will win the soundbreaking DVD, the Ken Womack book, and the CD uh, from the Berlin Music Ensemble. And that special contest will start on January the 6th. So uh, as a way of honoring George Martin on my website, there's a way that you can win three great prizes. And um, by the way, we mentioned last week, surprisingly, that the Sgt. Pepper box set and Flowers in the Dirt, the box set, weren't nominated at all for the Grammy Awards. But Soundbreaking is. Soundbreaking is nominated for um, Best Music Film for the Grammys, which will be broadcast on January the 28th. So we'll be rooting for that. Okay? So that contest is on my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. Also, be sure to look at the Beatles Trivia and Games page. You can win one of nine prizes every single week. The Ken Womack book is on there, as is the CD from the Berlin Music Ensemble. And that's it. Okay. And Steve? Um, you can get a hold of me at uh, BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. Your, um, I uh, have a Beatles news and information page where I post stories uh, and news about the Beatles. Um, and, of course, you can get a hold of us by writing Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. And our Facebook page is Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. Uh, and if you join, you get uh, the first news about the new show. Assuming you don't already subscribe, which you should to iTunes or Podbean or the TuneIn Radio app and you can get us that way too. Okay, so for Steve Marinucci and Ken Michaels, this is Alan Cozen saying thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.